Jerry Follis got tired of waiting for a literary agent or a publisher to decide to take on his book, so he recorded a reading of his novel and released it chapter by chapter as a podcast. People really liked it. Encouraged by that reaction, he published the book on his own. Again, people really liked it. Then it won the Stephen Leacock Award for humor, beating out major authors published by the big houses, and people really liked that. We like it that you're here today. Thanks <laughs> for joining us. Happy to be here, Nigel. Thanks for having me. Well, well, first of all, just to set the context, we're sitting in the shadow of the Library of Parliament on a beautiful sunny day. Your first novel, The Best Laid Plans, is set in Ottawa, the place that typically in other parts of the country gets a pretty rough go of it. Perhaps you could talk to your concerns about that. Well, I lived in Ottawa when I was quite a young man back in 1984. I I was only 24 years old, and I worked on Parliament Hill right here. Worked for a liberal cabinet minister and then worked with him in opposition. And to me, this is hallowed ground. This is the seat of our government, the seat of our democracy. It's a wonderful, glorious building, and my knees would go weak when I would walk through the front doors, through those front stone arches. I think it's a very special place regardless of of how it is maligned by other parts of the country or by Canadians who have grown disenchanted with politics. And believe me, there's plenty of reasons to become jaded and jaundiced about how we practice politics, but it doesn't take very long standing in this spot right here before those thoughts are kind of banished because it is really a wonderful building that reflects a leading democracy. It's a beautiful, regal, architectural marvel, really, But the hijinks that go on inside its wall bring up the opposite. Yes, it kind of belies the glory of of the building, which is unfortunate. But I think it's just how our politics has developed over the years. We've followed the lead of the United States. We've become much more partisan and nasty and personal and vitriolic. And the sense of respect that used to be shared across the floor of the House of Commons seems to have fallen away, and I I certainly regret that. I wonder whether it would have happened much faster had it not been unfolding in this wonderful building. So maybe it's actually been a, a mitigating factor. I hope that that will get turned around as... Canadians decide we're not going to put up with this kind of behavior anymore. Uh, And in a way, that's what the book takes a look at, is the state of of politics. And uh, it tries to shine a light on the problems we have in politics and perhaps to illuminate a path that might take us uh, out of the (laughs) what I think of as the dark ages of uber-partisan politics and into a, a better state of the world. When it does get turned around, this remains a wonderful place to house our, our democracy. Canadians coming here and and seeing it, what do you hope that that might inspire in people who visit and pilgrimage to this yes. place? Well, it, I wish that more Canadians would come. I know we're a very big country, <laughs> coast to coast to coast. It's a, a vast geography so that it's difficult for everyone to come. But at some point in your life, uh, you should make it a goal to come and visit Parliament Hill. And I hope that would temper what they might feel about politics. It, and you take a walk into the parliamentary library that we're looking at right now, and I don't know how anyone's breath could not be taken away by when you walk through those sliding doors from the main corridor in, in Center Block. It is a glorious building. The only part of the original Parliament buildings that survived the fire of 1916. Canada itself is, and this is one of the things you bring up in the novel, the politics of the country are based on place, meaning constituency first, versus nation first. Mm-hmm. And, so, and the political party's interest first. The, the national interest often takes a back seat and I, I've never really believed that the national interest is the sum of each constituency's interest. I think it's larger than that. Part of our obligation as citizens is to put the country first rather than our own personal interests. And that plays out in in the novel and it plays out in politics, uh, local politics, every day when you decide where you're going to build certain things or where you're going to put a dump or something like that. All of that comes into play, this NIMBY syndrome that we suffer. So I hope the book tries to remind people that the national interest ought to be at the top of our our, our list of priorities. 
and sometimes that means uh, sacrifices. But that's the price you pay for living in one of the best countries with the leading advanced democracies in the world. One of the topics of concern right now among the literary community is mm -hmm. the manner in which library and archives has been treated. The uh, cutbacks have been crippling, to quote a number of leading archivists. And part of the concern there is that partisan politics has played a role. By taking money from an arm's length organization whose job is to present Canadian history as objectively as it can be presented, to promoting events in Canadian history that, that may work in with the agenda of the political party in power. I'm thinking of the War of 1812, for example, and for the celebrations of World War I. I think it's very unfortunate that the Archives of Canada doesn't get the resources it needs because, I guess it's a bit of a cliche, but we really have to understand our history. It's essential, I think, to charting a course for our future, to know where we've come from. To know the mistakes we've made. Yeah, to put some historical context around events that have shaped the country. I was taught Canadian history when I went through school, and I know it's taught today, but I don't think they pay as much attention to it as when I went through school many, many years ago, because I have kids in the school system now. So the Archives of Canada is a crucial bastion of our national heritage that we need to preserve and, and support. So if there are partisan wranglings that have resulted in, in, in cutbacks or have contributed to the cutbacks, that is a really unfortunate reflection of how overly partisan politics is affecting our nation in not a, a very good way. In recent conversations with authors and, and talking to them about place, from the perspective of the literary tourist. Jane Urquhart, many of her novels are a direct result of her imagination, obviously, but the time she spent in archives. Michael Redhill's Consolation, the same thing. If it hadn't been for the City of Toronto archives and you know, the availability of important documentation, right. this is how we tell who we are to each other. And perhaps you could speak to the research that you may have had to do for this. For this book? Well, book. I spent a couple of years of my life uh, in this place, inside this building, much of it. When I worked for cabinet ministers and, and MPs in the mid-80s, so you lived it. I did. And yeah. I, uh, I had a pass, and I could go anywhere in center block I wanted. And why would you watch question period from your office when you could sit in the gallery and watch it unfold beneath you, which is what I did almost every day. When I would write speeches for my member or draft questions for question period and that kind of thing, I would often do it from a favored spot in the Library of Parliament because I just felt so inspired by all that was around me, the wood. The, the great words that have come out of it, I guess. Exactly. There yeah. was a bust of Wilfrid Laurier that I would sit beneath and somehow feel that I was in his aura as I would write these words that my member would utter in the House of Commons. And, and it was a thrill. It was a very special place. And that time, which was a long time ago, it was the mid-80s, but that is what has informed this novel. How would you like to see things change then, wave your... It effect you have waved a while. Yes, with that's your what the book. book is. Yes. Well, I, I would really like to see leaders and parties putting uh, the country first. I would like to see an end to attack ads and the deeply personal politics that seems to drive campaigns these days. I would like opposition parties to reconsider what it means to be an opposition party. And despite its name, which is not a great name for it because it seems to imbue it with the sense of opposition yeah. <laughs> by its very name, uh, I don't think opposition parties are there simply to oppose. I think they're there to consider carefully, to weigh, to hold the government to account, to support that which is worthy of support, and to oppose that which earns their disdain. To but improve legislation. Yes, yeah. yes. It is not yeah. simply to reject it out of hand simply because they weren't the party that, that presented it before the House. Mm -hmm. And I'd like politicians to think less about the four-year electoral horizon and more about the very really long-term issues that uh, affect the country that can't be solved in one electoral mandate, but the hard, heavy lifting needs to start. So if that's going to happen, it's going to require some particularly enlightened leaders spurred on by a more informed, more engaged electorate who have decided that they don't like politics the way it's practiced now. I think it's only the combination of those two that are going to start to turn this ship around because we've got you know, 
know, 150 years of inertia and momentum behind how we practice politics. And it's not an easy fix. It's going to be a slow, <laughs> a slow change. The voters have to be part of that and have to get engaged. And our voting rates in this country have been on a steady decline since the 1960s. In the early 1960s, 85 percent of eligible voters would cast a ballot, their yeah. ballot in the election. And now we're below 60 percent. So I think Canadians need to get more engaged and assume responsibility. I think that's their obligation of being citizens here. Yeah, connected to, to being a good citizen is knowledge of your own history. Yes. Perhaps if more Canadians had known that a majority government isn't necessarily the way to get things done in Ottawa, like right. Stephen Harper repeatedly told the electorate during the last election, and that Pearson's government, a minority, yes. brought in so many uh, fundamental programs while in minority, yes. maybe we wouldn't be having this conversation about cutbacks with yeah. archives particularly. No, I think that's a, that's a very good point. I think it's probably true that back then the spirit of compromise and mutual respect that seemed to exist among our political parties made that a little easier. But nevertheless, I think you could make a very strong argument that minority government is not necessarily a bad state of affairs as far as advancing public policy is concerned and tackling some of the national issues that we confront. Well, the other thing, too, with a majority government, it almost invites disdain of institutions because they don't necessarily no. have to go and work right. through the house, do they? They just say, you know what, fine, blabber on all you want, we're going to pass it anyway. That's it's exactly right. Uh, and in the house, that's what it means to have a majority, is that you can, uh, you can do that. And I think Canadians are perhaps kind of wily about these things. So I, I think they elect minority governments when they worry about democracy being overrun by a heavy majority where you don't necessarily have to respect the traditions of, of the House and, and all that has made this country great. Just in, in closing, what do you hope that people will take away from your book? The, the main message I think you've already delivered. Yep. What can Canadians do then to follow your advice? I think the most important thing they can do is to have some hope in the future of their democracy and to recognize that if they are unhappy with what unfolds on their TV screens at night on the news when they see how politicians are playing politics in this country, that the response ought not to be to turn away from democracy. In fact, quite the opposite, is to turn towards it, and it's to step up and get engaged and demand a higher standard from our, our elected officials. And when those pollsters call, letting them know that we don't want to hear politicians talking about uh, their opponents in such a negative way. We want to hear what they're going to present and what they're going to do, mm -hmm. changes they're going to make to further uh, our democracy. So I think there's a role for every Canadian to play, but it means getting engaged. I, I sort of think we have suffered from the apathy of affluence in this country. We're a wealthy nation. When we turn on the hot water in the morning, hot water comes out of the tap. When we put our garbage on the street on Wednesday mornings, it's picked up when we come home. There is not always a lot of incentive for us to engage in public affairs and public policy debates and politics and democracy because things seem to work pretty well. But uh, I think it's perhaps more fragile than we, than we might think. And if we just ignore it and let it unfold without our engagement, without our involvement, without our, our interest, it may fall away quickly. And again, coming to this place, Parliament Hill, and just taking it in, and I think it, it does have a reinforcing effect on what we need to protect and what we need to demand of our politicians. I agree. This, this building stands here and is not going to go, it's not going anywhere. It's not to be moved. It will always be, as far as I'm concerned, the seat of our government. And Laurier stood in these halls. Sir John A. Macdonald stood in these halls and they formed the, this country. So whoever's going through its halls these days, and whether they are being respectful of the House's traditions, or democracy's traditions, they're going to pass through it and out the other side at some point, and a new crop of politicians will fill these halls and fill the House of Commons. So I think this stands as continuing hope, because it's always going to be here. Mm -hmm. It will outlast the politicians that we perhaps don't think kindly of, 
and will still be here when those who we hope will guide us into the next century. It'll still be here, and that's uh, that's good news. So I think it is a very special place and serves a purpose because it is an anchor. It's an, it anchors our democracy. We can be proud of it, can't we? I think we can. Any foreigner to this country, any visitor from another nation, would have no doubt what this building is when they drive by. You don't even have to ask. You know immediately that it's where our government meets. Just before I uh, let you go, perhaps we could get an idea of what or where you've gone from this. Well, this is the novel that keeps on, on giving. The Best Laid Plans. The Best Laid Plans. After it, it won Canada Reads, uh, CBC has now picked it up and it's in development as a, as a TV miniseries right now. <laughs> and there's even a, a theatre company in Vancouver that is developing it as a stage musical with a Governor General Award winning playwright. So it's it's astonishing what it has done. Uh, The sequel has done very well, The High Road, and it has meant that I'm spending less time in my day job and more time out there talking about the books and and writing new ones. Uh, My third one is about to come out, although it's not about politics this time. I'm working on my fourth. And are you continuing to right the wrongs of various... (laughs) Well, I like to think of them as as satire, not just as as comedy. Comedy makes you laugh. Satire makes you laugh, but if it's working well, it ought to make you think. So I am I'm taking a look at Canada-U.S. relations in a way in in my third novel and how we view senior citizens is another topic, another social challenge uh, I take a look at, and uh, it's a lot. I think people will enjoy it. If you enjoyed the first two novels, I may be a one-trick pony because I think it sort of feels the same to read the third one, even though they're new characters in a different story altogether. But uh, I hope people enjoy them. Great. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to talk with us. Pleasure, Nigel. Thanks for having me. I'll be speaking with uh, Terry Paulus, who is the author of The Best Laid Plans, published by McClellan Stewart, a Douglas Gibson book. And uh, what's the name of the second one? High Road? The High Road. The High Road, and that's also by McClellan and Stewart. And I assume you're staying with the same publisher? Uh, So the third? The third one is called Up and Down. Great. Good. Well, thanks again. Thanks, Nigel.